Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and uh, once again, you know who this is. The star of my videos is uh, Shackleton the Explorer. So I'm continuing my discussions of the implications to um, the planet if there was a nuclear war between India and Pakistan. India and Pakistan are, there's always conflict between them over contested regions such as Kashmir. Um, and they're both rapidly expanding the number of nuclear weapons that each side has. And a recent paper modeled what would happen both in the region if there was a nuclear exchange and also what would happen globally. The aerosols that would be lofted up from the incineration of cities, the black carbon would get up into the upper atmosphere. Then the sunlight is absorbed on this black carbon, heating up the black carbon, heating up the air around, causing them to go much, much higher up into the atmosphere, blocking out lots of the sun and causing global food shortages. So I'll just get back right back into the uh, data here where I left off from my previous video. So this is showing uh, the ocean net product, net primary productivity, NPP, as a percent change. So a drop of about 50% in, in uh, and that, that's with the U.S.-Russia nuclear war. India and Pakistan war would be the brown red curve, so a drop of about 20% percent, 25 percent. This is the ocean net product, primary productivity, the phytoplankton, etc. And if you go on the land, the net product, primary productivity with the U.S.-Russia all-out nuclear war, it basically blocks the light and kills completely the net prime, primary productivity on land. It goes to zero, 100 percent drop, okay? And then it takes 10 to 15 years to recover. In the case of India and Pakistan, with their reduced arsenals, um, much smaller than the U.S.-Russia ones, we still get a drop of from 20 to 40 percent initially. So there's global starvation. People basically, there's global food shortages. People, um, you know, it's chaos breaks out around the world. It's not, it's not a, any nuclear exchange is not just a regional exchange. It's a global changing event. And in terms of the distribution of the net primary productivity on land, this is the control group with no change, okay? And this is in, so it's in grams of carbon per square, per square meter of surface area per year. And you can see these regions of high um, net primary productivity, okay? Both on the land and in the ocean. And this is if there is, the, this is modeling a, the nuclear war between India and Pakistan and it shows the drop of the net primary productivity over the earth. This is two years after the exchange. So an India-Pakistan war could inject as much as 40 million tons of black, thick black smoke into the earth's atmosphere. Um, that would be about, that would be 40 teragrams on this scale. Okay, so again, it's, it's between the, the brownish line and the red line. Okay, so it would drop the land net primary productivity 20 to 40 percent and it would take you know 10 to 15 years to recover. This smoke would block 20 to 35 percent of the sunlight. It would cool the earth's surface by 2 to 5 degrees celsius which is 3.6 degrees to 9 degrees fahrenheit. It would reduce precipitation by 15 to 30 percent with larger regional impacts There'd be worldwide food shortages, threatening mass starvation, and many other additional collateral fatalities. Recovery would take at least 10 years. It would take 10 to 15 years. Okay, so basically, it would, there'd be dangerous consequences for all organisms on the food chain, including humans, of course. Okay, it's really hard to, for people to wrap their heads around this. Like the scope of such a war, even just a regional war between India and Pakistan, you know, it's very difficult for people to understand how bad these consequences would be. You know, we kind of block it out of our minds, but we need these studies to remind us that the end of the Cold War did not eliminate the risk of global nuclear war. So hopefully Pakistan and India read this paper and, you know, heed the 
you know, understand that it's the whole world that could be affected or would be affected, not just that region. Now, earlier on in this year, there were some good papers on wildfires giving us a lot of information on nuclear winter. So if you just Google wildfires nuclear winter, you can get loads of articles. And I'll talk about one specific one here. Okay, this is a um, National Geographic article. This is the smoke from wildfires in BC in 2017. There were massive wildfires, huge amounts of smoke coming up in over northern Canada, August 15, 2017. So this is a mosaic image. You can see there's a line. So it's a bunch of satellite images stitched together to show the whole region. So to better grasp nuclear winter, we can study these wildfire clouds. So this cloud lingered in the atmosphere for a year, showing scientists how a cloud from a nuclear bomb would behave. Okay, so if a nuclear war were ever to occur, the bombs would flatten entire cities, spread radiation far and wide, the smoke would raise vast swaths of forest, toxic smoke would go into the upper atmosphere, it would block the sun and trigger what we call a global nuclear winter. At least that's what the models say. So the wildfires, actually the data from the wildfires is confirming the key physics that undergoes that is behind these apocalyptic nuclear winter forecasts. And that, that's the, the um, basically the black carbon goes up into the upper atmosphere and it doesn't come down quickly because it's black. It absorbs solar energy, it heats up the particles, it heats up the air around it. They continue to rise upward by convection. So it stays up in the atmosphere for a long time and has global climate changing consequences. Okay, um, so the models have shown this for years, but it was never really observed until there was smoke put up into the atmosphere, high atmosphere by these fires. And because of the drying of the forest and the very, very um, hot situations, um, and, you know, and the size of these uh, fires now, these wildfires, um, you know, we're getting lofting of particles right up into the upper atmosphere, into the stratosphere. So we're able to study this. So August 12th, 2017, a blistering hot pyrotechnic summer in British Columbia. Weather conditions conspired with the intense heat from a rash of wildfires to create a powerful updraft. This updraft pushed particles aloft, created a cluster of towering smoke-filled thunderclouds. Nothing had been seen quite at that scale. It was the mother of all fire clouds, basically. So like a chimney, the fire cloud began funneling smoke eight miles up into the stratosphere, creating a hazy plume. Over the course of two months, the plume rose and rose and rose because it's black carbon heating the, heating the air around it and the particles, so it expands and goes higher and higher and higher, expanded across the northern hemisphere, peaked at 14 miles. Okay, so the particles were lofted up an additional six miles or more. Smoke was in the stratosphere for the better part of a year. Okay, um, so this was studied. Now, the, the plume's ascent was best explained by black carbon comprising only about 2% of its mass. So it validates the theory, the nuclear winter theories. In fact, the, the nuclear winter scenario is worse than we even thought. Okay. Um, and uh, so basically it tells us that, oh, there's also a lot, so there's lots of organic matter and people thought that these, these particles, organic matter, wasn't normally considered previously in nuclear winter models because it was thought they'd be degraded, but they last in the stratosphere for months. Okay, so the, up, lo the lofting effect, the nuclear winter effect is a lot worse. Now, it was estimated in the 2017 BC fires, there were 331,000 tons of particles shot into the stratosphere, but that's a factor of at least 10 times smaller than the amount we'd estimate from a war between India and Pakistan. Okay, so it's a very, very grim situation. Um, this is a paper that was written at the time, Black Carbon Lost Wildfire Smoke High Into the Stratosphere to Form a Persistent Plume. Okay, um, but the key thing I, you know, you can have a look at that paper, but the key paper I want to look at is this one, 
which just came out. So rapidly expanding nuclear arsenals in Pakistan and India portend regional and global catastrophe. So Pakistan and India may have four to 500 nuclear weapons by 2025, with yields from 12 to 45 kilotons up to a few hundred kilotons. So just to remind you on the yields, um, these are, you know, their, their, their yields of, uh, this is, um, their, their yields around the Hiroshima and Nagasaki yields or yields around this sort of thing. So we have lots more weapons that are much more in much higher yields than that. But, but uh, you know, if India used 800 nukes to attack urban centers in Pakistan, and Pakistan used 150, there's a lot more targets, a lot more cities in India with over 100,000 people than there is in Pakistan. People, you'd have 50 to 125 million people dying within the first week. That's more than all of World War II. The nuclear ignited fires would loft 16 to 36 teragrams of black carbon into the black carbon and smoke into the atmosphere. They would heat up and become self-lofted and go higher and higher in the stratosphere. They'd spread around the globe within weeks. They'd decrease surface sunlight 20 to 35 percent, cool the surface by 2 to 5 degrees Celsius, reduce precipitation by 15 to 30 percent. It would take 10 to 15 years for them to recover and they would basically reduce net primary productivity plant growth 15 to 30 percent on the land, 5 to 15 percent in the oceans, threatening mass starvation and huge other, you know, collateral uh, f fatalities. Okay, so you can have a look at all of the details in this paper. This is the plot I showed showing the number of warheads um, in the different arsenals. So India and Pakistan are here, you know, increasing rapidly. Um, basically, I'll go down to the next figure. So this is the, the casualties um, or fatalities. So fatalities, people dying right away. Casualties, people wounded, perhaps dying later. This is um, a 15 kiloton nuclear exchange. This is uh, 50 kilotons and this is 100 kilotons. Um, so this is immediate casualties, 120 million here. Um, if 250 targets were hit and, you know, uh, you know, with an additional 60 million or so to follow, this is, if in, this is in India and this is in Pakistan. Okay, so huge numbers of fatalities in those regions. Um, this is the black carbon that would be injected up into the atmosphere. Okay, uh, in terms of teragrams, so huge amounts of black carbon put up into the atmosphere. That black carbon aerosol would block sunlight. So this is the amount of, this is the effective aerosol optical depth. So the larger the number, the thicker the aerosols, the less light that is going through. And this is the change in the short wave flux at the surface of the earth. So with a U.S.-Russia exchange, we suddenly drop about up to 75% less sunlight hitting the earth. So imagine what that does to all of the growing plants. And that only recovers after a decade or so. Okay, so this is an all-out nuclear war between U.S. and Russia. Again, about the uh, 40 teragrams or so is an India-Pakistan a nuclear exchange, so that drops sunlight from about a that drops sunlight about 40 percent down to about the 60 percent level, and again it takes 10 years to recover. Okay, um, this is the temporal variation in global precipitation and temperature um, following a nuclear conflict. So this is a precipitation change. We get uh, a, a drop of about 60 percent. It bottoms out after about three years, but stays kind of flat at low levels uh, for, for uh, you know, many years. Um, in the case of U.S. Russia and in the case of Pakistan, India, it drops about 30 to 40 percent. This is the temperature change. Look what happens if there's a U.S.-Russia war. The temperature drops 10 degrees Celsius, you know, three years out. And uh, India, Pakistan, it drops like, uh, you know, four to six degrees Celsius and basically destroys global crop production. I showed this image before. Okay, thank you for listening.